So hi guys, it's Pete Shursby here from Make or Repair um, and I'm going to do an extra video on the current probes. So I was originally planning to do two, uh, now I'm going to do three. So uh, hopefully you may have seen the previous video where I kind of explained uh, my intentions and how the current probe would work and did the original piece of work in the lab to just uh, prove the concept. Today I'm going to look at uh, how I've refined that and uh, there's a few models around, there's the 3D model that I'm going to use and things like that. Um, and uh, then in the final video um, I will just video how I've sent that off to the manufacturer, the stuff coming back, the assembly and uh, a little bit of testing on the final product. Why have I split it into three? Well because it's taking a bit longer than intended and um, so I just wanted to keep the momentum up with this video and uh, I felt that just uh, showing the additional refinement of the design before it goes off to be manufactured would be a good idea. Now despite the fact this is being manufactured I'm only having 10 made and uh, I do anticipate there will be another iteration of design after I've received those. They are certainly not going to be anything close to uh, my desired outcome and uh, as we'll see in a minute there are some problems with the 3d modeling and, uh, and that sort of stuff anyway first things first let's look at the circuit diagram and the changes that i made to that so you may recall from the first video that i was a bit concerned about the thermal stability um, certainly around the zeroing circuit which is over here on the left hand side of the diagram <clears throat> now this was really really sensitive to to you know if you just touched the trimmer then uh, then it would drift quite a lot thermally um, and yeah I was gonna gonna just send it off and see if it was better on the main board with no long leads and capacitance and all that sort of stuff and I decided not to do that I decided I would go back and just give it a bit more thought um, so the original was based on a Zener it's essentially the same thing what we've got here is a little regulated supply at 3.3 volts uh, and it goes into a trimmer and we pick off a voltage and that goes as an offset into the first stage of the operational amplifier um, and we've still got that here but there's a few slightly different change to the way it's laid out and um, yeah and I'm using a regulator instead of a Zener and that sort of stuff so why do I think there's a problem with a Zener well I'm just going to copy a resistor over here just to make up a little circuit to one side uh, and not like that and we will take a look at that. So the original circuit it's kind of a bit like this. Let's get this right, that can go there, that can go there, that can go there. And uh, yeah, and then kind of tapping into here we have the output going to the Okay. So in the original circuit this resistor just here um, represents the Zener. I'm just I'm not going to bother to draw the circuit properly, but a Zener essentially um, one way of thinking about it is a dynamic resistance, um, which is quite a, um, a low resistance. And then we have another resistor here. So we would have let's say six volts in the top of this resistor, a 3.3 volt Zener, um, and essentially. Um, the Zener would have a reverse breakdown voltage of 3.3 volts, um, but it's not it's not a sharp cutoff. Um, it's 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 a curve. So you know, at one at one current it will be 3.3, at another it will be 3.35, at another it will be 3.1, and and so on. There's a lot of variability uh, on that depending how much current we've got going through it. Now on the right hand side we've got um, this top resistor is representing the trimmer uh, and the bottom resistor is representing a little offset so that you, we're limiting the range that the trimmer uses so it's not going from um, it's not covering the full 3.3 volts we're actually just covering sort of between uh, 0 and 0 0.8 volts or something like that so that's how you might kind of think of doing that and that seems okay because the impedance through uh, is in parallel with the Zener is constant but it's not because um, it changes thermally um, and the trimmer has a very different temperature coefficient than the fixed resistors that are around it why does that matter um, because after all on the junction of the Zen and the resistor we've got a fixed 3.3 volts but we haven't and that's the problem um, because 
let's say it's six volts and we've got 3.3, well, the 2.7 volts that we're losing, we're losing through this top resistor. So, if the resistor over on the right hand side changes because of temperature, then to keep the 3.3 volts, the amount of current flowing through, through that resistor is different. And that means the amount of current that goes through the Zena must also change. But if the current going through the Zena changes, then that means it's on a different part of its performance curve and the voltage that it attempts to is its uh, reverse breakdown voltage changes because the current has changes. So, um, so yeah, so the whole thing actually isn't very thermally stable. It's made worse by the fact that we've got two different temperature coefficients on two different components that are in series. Um, in fact, we've got three components in series, really, um, all of which have different te temperature coefficients, potentially. So um, that's all pretty nasty, actually. Um, now, usually it'd be okay. It would. I've used that in circuits before, and it's and it's fine. But the problem in this circuit is we, of course, then follow that by thirty odd times amplification. Um, and yeah, and uh, any error, any change in that offset is getting multiplied up by that thirty times as well. So um, so it, it's just not stable enough um, for this purpose. Um, so instead I'm using an HT7533 uh, 3.3 volt regulator and I've picked that specifically because it's a really really low voltage dropout. Um, so usually I would expect to be running this from a 12 volt plug-in pack um, and uh, since I'm going down from the 12 volt is split into two so it becomes plus minus six volts. So six volts down to 3.3 is a big drop we can cope with that with just about any regulator on the market but i might also want to run it from 20 odd volts and that immediately eliminates a huge raft of regulators um, or i might want to run it from a 9 volt battery and a 9 volt battery we want, to, we want to keep that working all the way down to about 7 volts um, so 7 volts divided by 2 is 3.5 volts so i still need to regulate my 3.3 volts despite the fact i've only got a 3.5 volt supply um, so the HT7533-1, which I've picked, um, has a voltage dropout of only 55 millivolts. Um, so we can run that down almost all the way to, well, let's say 3.4 volts, something in that region. So, uh, and it has an upper voltage limit of about 30 volts. So this, this will run off, um, you know, anything from a 9 volt battery all the way up to a sort of plus 24 volt supply, that type of thing. Um, in fact, it will be the upper limit of the TL072 op amp that limits the, the upper voltage that we can go to. Okay, um, and therefore the voltage is actually just limiting the dynamic range. How far, how many amps can we report out to the oscilloscope? So that's the, the main change. There's a little change over on the right hand side here. Um, I had a similar arrangement with um, a resistor in series with a trimmer just to limit its range and I decided to get rid of that and just put a better quality trimmer in. So this is a 25 turn Bourne's 50K trimmer now. Um, and that gives really, really good range. And from the per point of view of making this a general purpose amplifier, yeah, that's that's really, really helpful. Um, and uh, you see that uh, the optional capacitors have also changed slightly. Um, I am intending to have them fit C6 optional over on the, the that goes in, in parallel with the gain control. Uh, and that's because it's possible we could be going for like 20 to 30 times gain on this output section and i would like a little bit of stability just in case we get any instability in that output stage i want that uh, capacitor there just to uh, just to help to uh, cancel that out uh, make sure it doesn't oscillate at all okay that's the circuit then um let's take a quick look at uh, the 3D box, I think, and then we'll finish up by a quick look at uh, this circuit operating in the lab. But first job, we're at the computer, so let's have a look at the uh, at the box. So here it is. I'm just looking from the side at the moment, um, and uh, I haven't modelled the spring in here. This peg here just uh, accepts one end of the spring, and uh, if I turn it around, you can see there's another peg in the top half that accepts the spring and we've got a um, 
hinge in the middle, um, which I haven't put the peg in uh, at the moment because that will be a steel peg. So I'll have that made separately. Or oh, I'll make it probably. Okay, so what's it like? Well, it's like a clothes peg. Um, total length is 85 millimeters, I think, um, which makes it pretty small. Uh, and it is, I think, 14 millimeters uh, across in this direction here. So just a fraction over half inch thick. Um, the hole is basically five millimeters. Uh, radius, it's, I can, yeah, yeah I mean, it's obviously not quite round, but um, see that in a second and uh, yeah and uh, and this is set up so that uh, it should leave easy now this has been designed to be printed on a resin printer so it's additive manufacture and uh, that means we can have straight sides we don't have to tape them and all that sort of stuff however i have hit a few problems with um, the 3d modeling software so let's for example zoom in just on this corner here so this is the back edge. Of course, I want a nice little radius on there, which I've put on. However, you notice there's these funny little sticky up flanges in the corner, and they don't really exist in the model. They are where the model has not correctly merged these two faces, um, although they're a plane. Um, it isn't, isn't recognizing that they're a single plane and so actually this is radius on one piece and uh, this infinitely thin piece is being left which means i can't radius off this corner here which i would really like to do uh, i'd like to radius the corner between these two pieces really but i can't do that and i'd like to radius this piece and i can't do that and so on so um so that's really really annoying um and if we look at another radius point i wanted to radius these the inner edge of this cutout for the cable to go through now, the left hand side over here, I can apply a lovely radius and it looks absolutely fantastic. The right hand side, if I try and, oh, I can't turn this around. If I attempt to apply the radius to this side, however, all that happens is the CAD software uh, crashes. So that's not terribly helpful. Now, it might be me, the way I'm doing my designs and things like that, or maybe it's the software, it's difficult to tell. But uh, it's certainly not quite understanding what's going on with some of these edges and this is not a difficult design essentially this is a flat extruded into a box and yeah that type of thing um, anyway let's have a quick look at the different parts that make this up so the intention is to have lots of parts and these will be kind of set out like a um, like a kit um, on a flat plane so this for example is the build plane for this piece this is the build piece for the bottom box. Um, it's got a lid. This is the build plane for that. And uh, there's a separate hinge as well. Um, so that will all be built as separate pieces. Let's bring it into isometric and we'll just look at the different parts. So buried in the inside is the PCB. Um, and that's actually the first point in the build of this box is to export the PCB from the PCB software and across into here and uh, if we just nip and have a quick look in the pcb software i've got something across there, there, there we go. then um there we go and a quick look at that so here is the pcb in the pcb software so this pcb is 11 millimeters wide by 66 millimeters long so pretty small and uh on the right hand side here we've got the power input um, we've got a couple of pins for the output we've got a bit of uh, we've got three little pins on the left hand side which are for the sensor to be soldered onto and the rest is all just surface mount now these two holes even here are actually not screw holes these are um, just uh, indexing holes to uh, so that when this fits in the box uh, it can be indexed accurately into position and uh, this will actually just clip into the box there is there is no screw there is not a single screw in this build um, but it will still come apart happily um, for repair or whatever um, so that's that let's go into the 3d model side of that so here's the 3d model in the um, PCB software this is Altium um, circuit studio um, so there's the 3d model and uh, with Altium in your sort of uh, build outputs, you can specify you want it to export the 3D model. Uh, and that's what I've done, literally exported it from here. 
and then imported it into the 3D modeling software. Um, and there are two basic components that, uh, that dictate everything else, the PCB and then the ferrite and the sensor, which are just there. Um, I've, I've modeled those as a single piece just because it's convenient. Um, so the ferrite is split um, apart by the width of the sensor and I'm allowing um, that so I don't have to machine that part at all um, and uh, I have tested that in the lab and that works absolutely fine so um, the sensor is 1.5 millimeters thick so there's a 1.5 millimeter gap um, between the two halves of the ferrite um, and that 1.5 millimeter gap is facilitated by the thickness of this section here the actual sort of part of the box into which it is mounted um, so next part on is of course there is a lower box which holds the PCB and the ferrite in place uh, and gives access for um, installing it there is the lid that goes on that box because obviously we have to get inside it um, which is clipped in and you can kind of see the clips I think um, there is the top um, which uh, obviously attaches to the hinge and the hinge you can see there uh, has pegs that go down into the bottom section to locate that in position uh, and a peg that sticks up for a spring to go on it. Um, so let's just uh, separate some of these pieces out a little bit. Um, so first of all, let's take the uh, one of the last pieces to be fitted will be this top section. So if we pick the top and we can move it uh, out of the way a little bit somehow. Let's move it off to one side and uh, up a bit. We should be able to see that easily now. So we take a look at the top from the underside. You can kind of see that it's fairly straightforward. It has a recess for the uh, ferrite to fit into. And um, the ferrite that's going into this side, this will be kind of like a, a low modulus silicon infill behind it. So it'll be kind of glued in place, but it'll be glued in a slightly spongy surface so that it's actually sort of springy against the bottom part. Um, then we've got the holes which are for the sort of pivot hinge to go and then just here we've got a little standoff for the spring to fit onto uh, and other than that it's just really a shape there's a bit of a radius there so it can turn freely and not catch when it's rotating and uh, yeah and a bit of strength around the edges and some cross struts to uh, to give it strength um, and that's it for that I think if we go back and look at the top this is the hinge section so this is made as a separate section and uh, yeah it's unfortunate to have to do that um, but I had intended to make the bottom part a lot flatter just wedge shaped and um, and that so this is a three-sided box essentially there around this and then back down, and then obviously the end um, and the bottom is open but uh, I had intended to make the top kind of clip in um, because then I could actually sort of build that as a separate piece in fact it doesn't really work out that way that well manufacturing it's a lot easier to make this hinge as a separate piece um, and again it's got the spring offset it's obviously got a hole for the spindle to go through um, and it's got locating lugs um, that fit into uh, if i'm finding the right piece there we go there's the hinge that kind of fit into the bottom section just to locate it they're, they're just uh, indexing lugs that's all you can see the ferrite sticking out, so that's the top half of the ferrite there. So let's move the ferrite out. Actually, I'll leave the ferrite in place for the moment. Let's turn this box upside down if I can. There we go. And we'll just move that lid out of the way. Oops, wrong way. So we move the lid up. So we can see on the lid that it has these little clips and uh, and they go on to corresponding pieces in the bottom section. Uh, move that, that way out of the way. There we go. So yeah, so the lid has these little uh, springy clips. They're only five millimeters wide. They look quite wide on the diagram, but uh, they're only five millimeters wide. And these are little shelvy bits that they just clip attached to. Um, so it can just be clipped on and then popped off with uh, a little tool if needs be. There's the ferrite on the inside of this box. Um, and uh, 
we zoom in on that, you can see it's got locating corners. Uh, and it's got these protrusions here with little clips on for it to just sort of literally clip into place. Uh, it probably will need a little bit of epoxy or silicon just to stop it rattling, but that's all. Here is the back of the sensor, just there. So that would have three pins coming off it and going directly into these three holes. Um, and as I say, once I've built the first one, I'll be able to make a bending jig so that uh, that can be done uh, easily. There's the PCB in place, and we can see that there are plastic locating lugs penetrating through the holes that are in the PC. And you can also see the little clips on this side and this side down here that hold the PCB in place. And also that the power block just penetrates through a similar size hole in the back uh, of the box. Now at the top, we've then got the hole for the cable to go out to the uh, oscilloscope just here. And if you look at the back of that, that's recessed so that you can take a small sort of gland on the back there, just to stop friction damage to the cable where it comes out. Um, as it stands at the moment, I'm not showing a cable relief mechanism for that. Um, in a final production, I will put that actually on this side wall because I just kind of haven't really got enough space. Um, and uh, and essentially the cable will just wrap around uh, and come back out, not a figure of eight, but just a, a loop to uh, just to release the, uh, the the cable strength and uh, and yeah, that will kind of clip in and hold in place. So that will be fine. So yeah, so that's it really. Um, let's just move the board out of the way, I suppose, just so we can kind of see what's going on there. If I just slide that out, actually, I didn't do that right. I slid the actual PCB board out and left all the components in place, which isn't really good. Um, slide the whole PCB out, that would be better. Uh, and we can kind of see the locating pegs and they've got some standoffs. And the reason they've got standoffs, um, and you can actually see the uh, little locating lugs coming through from the hinge there, three locating lugs to keep it all stable. And these are the indexing pins for the PCB. And uh, the standoffs on the bottom are because uh, this guy here, the power socket and uh, the cable when it's soldered in, they, they are both uh, through holes and therefore they need a little bit of space uh, underneath the board. And I've left 1.5 millimeters underneath the board. So this looks quite big and chunky as it is, but um, remember that space there is only 1.5 millimeters high. Uh, and this is 1.6 millimeters across the whole pin. So it's not really very big at all. Anyway, there you go, that, that, is, the, that is the case. And uh, yeah, designed to be resin printed. Um, so uh, watch this space. I will be producing a small prototype myself um, just before it goes off, but uh, that will be in the next video where I show all the files packaged and sent to the manufacturer. Now I can still achieve a little bit of thermal drift by touching these resistors which form a bit of a divider circuit but um, that's certainly a lot more stable. Now I still have quite a lot of noise on there but I'm kind of not surprised given the amount of circuitry on here. Um, but yeah we should be able to trim that out. I'll do it for the moment so yeah we're about to 10 milli volts out at the moment. But anyway, um, so I, I don't have my DC load available at the moment, so I've got a resistor just here. And uh, this guy here, um, which is 680 ohms, I think. Um, so I'm putting 35 volts through that. Let's turn it on. So you can see we're reading 150 now. And right up there to 500, nearly 600. And we're actually delivering 52 uh, milliamps so we're pretty much on the uh, on the money here so uh, not unhappy with that at all um, bit of noise there we've been even getting the 10 millivolt milliamp resolution but uh, hopefully once this is on a proper circuit board um, then it will be better so so the other thing on this circuit just here um, is that we've got the closed peg back and we've got our new small our new small, let's see if we can get this to zoom in a lot. Ferrite in place. 
So this is the smallest ferrite that I bought. Okay, so this is the ferrite with a five millimeter hole in it. And uh, it's not very clear on here, but essentially I've just got it clamped together. Now, rather than grinding a gap in this, um, I've actually left it without. So the ferrite actually doesn't make contact on either side. There we go, beautiful diagram. Try and hold it steady. So the ferrite is like this, it's split and it has a gap on both sides, an equal gap on both sides. Now in manufacture, uh, I'm actually gonna cover one of these sides, uh, or possibly both, um, with plastic that will equal the thickness of this device over on this side here. Um, so this will be a fixed side uh, over here, probably going something like that. Um, so we'll come on there, this will be fixed and this one here will have a slight amount of stringiness to it so it just comes down and clamps onto the plastic and the actual device on top. Um, Turns out that seems to be quite common. I was looking at my Fluke um, current clamp. I was also looking at the Hantec current clamp. And both of them actually have an insulator running right through this uh, gap on this side. So I decided it made sense to uh, just make it the same thickness as the uh, device here. And the thickness of the device is, how thick are these devices? Quick measure up. Okay, so I realise you probably can't see this at all, but anyway. They're 1.5 millimetres. That's easy. So, yeah, so I will, um, on one side, I will mould something like a, a 1.4 millimetre um, or 1.5 millimetre wrap over um, so that uh, that ferret can actually be pressed up against it um, when it's installed. Um, So with the new sensors, um, these are the actual sensors I intend to fit. So these are the more sensitive ones than when I was doing the previous tests. Um, yeah, and uh, with this circuit that I've got at the moment, yeah, I am getting a full, easily getting the, the full um, one millivolt per milliamp uh, scale that I was hoping for. So uh, anyway, all being well, um, that's quite a lot of improvement. I'm really glad to have tested these, in fact, this ferrite, because the whole physical build of the case is uh, dependent upon choosing the right ferrite. That's done. Um, Stabilising the temperature problem, that's also done. So, um, so hopefully that's uh, a useful update on the progress so far. I uh, hope you enjoyed that. If you did, don't forget to uh, like and subscribe. Uh, and of course, uh, stay tuned for the next instalment. See you soon. Take care.